In this video, I'm going to do the Unit 3 test, which from the Nelson's textbook is a test on quadratic functions. So if you don't have Nelson and you need a, some practice with your quadratics, this is a place to be. I will leave a link in the description for you to download the practice test. Or once again, you can just stop it and, uh, you know, do the questions as I show them to you. So the first question here says, consider the following quadratic function. Consider it. <laughs> I always thought that was kind of a funny thing to say. What if I don't want to consider it? And it says that f at x equals minus 2 x plus 4 squared plus 1. Okay, so think about what you're looking at here, right? Well, how, would the, how, how is this going to look if you graphed it? Because we're going to do that a little bit later. State the direction of opening the vertex and the axis of symmetry. Okay, make sure when you're doing a test, you read the question, make sure you're answering everything. So there's three things that are being asked for here. The direction of opening, I'm just gonna put a little one, two, three by these so we don't write them out three times. So the first thing, the direction of opening, we know by looking at this graph that it's been reflected about the x-axis. So instead of being up, it's going to be going down. Okay, so the direction of opening is going to be concave down. That was easy. The second question, or second part, so what is the vertex? And you know that this is in the format um, y equals a bracket x minus h squared plus k, whoops, plus k, where the vertex is h and k. So we want the vertex to be the opposite sign of this one. So the vertex is going to be minus 4 and 1. Because this is minus h, remember? So you have to change the sign. And I would just say x's are weird, so this is going to be a negative 1. And y's are normal. And the axis of symmetry, well remember the axis of symmetry goes right through the vertex. So that means that the, the equation for the axis of symmetry is going to be the equation of the line that includes the x-coordinate. So it's going to be x is equal to minus 4. And there you go. We've got three marks already. State the domain and range. Okay, so we know that the domain of a quadratic function is all of the x values, right? It's x left and right. So it's going to be real numbers for the domain. So the domain is going to be x, such that x is an element of real numbers. That's easy. And the range, we have to be careful because we know that the because a parabola is concave down, that the range is going to be something less than or equal to this height. Okay, so what is the, the height of my parabola here? Well, we know that the vertex was at minus 4 and 1. So this, this coordinate here is going to be minus 4, 1. We're going to graph that in just a second. So from 1, it's only going down from there. So the range is going to be f at x, because that's what we've been given, such that f at x is less than or equal to 1, and f at x is an element of real numbers. And there we go, domain and range done. State whether there is a maximum or a minimum value, what it is, and when it occurs. So it's just kind of semantics, right? It's just another way of saying the same thing. The maximum value is the vertex, at the vertex. So the maximum value is 1, and that's going to occur when x is minus 4. So maximum, because we're at the top of the hill here, so maximum value is 1 when x is minus 4, when it occurs. Okay, graph the function. Oh, there's no board, no axis on here. So let's make one. Okay, so we've got, whoops, throwing things around. It's such a cold, rainy, wet day today. You can probably hear the rain out there. So um, let's give this... Uh, We'll give the coordinates, we'll, we'll put them up here a little bit. We're going to be at minus 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Here's minus 4. And the height is going to be 1. That's here. 
and it's concave down. Now, I might want some other points here. Right? We've got the vertex. What happens when um, x is 0? That will give us an idea of where it's going to cross the y-axis. So if I go back up here to my function, when x is 0, I would have 4 squared is 16 um, times minus 2. Ooh, this is minus 32 plus 1 is minus 31. So that's not really going to show up on my scale here. How about um, we find another value? Let's say when x is minus 3, and that will give us on both sides. So if I do minus 3 or minus 5, <coughs> I should be at the same height, right? Because it'll be the same distance from my, my vertex or my axis of symmetry. So if I put in... Um, let's go to minus 2. So minus 2 plus 4 is 2 squared is 4 times 2 is minus 8 plus 1 is minus 7. So when I'm here, I'm at minus 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Ooh, I just made it on my graph. Now the point 2 away from here is going to be at the same height because we know that parabolas are symmetrical. So I can just do something like this. There we go. Make sure you put arrows on the bottom. Um, graph it. Usually you have to, you know, label your axis, give some points so they know what the scale, your teacher knows what your scale is. So that was minus 7. And um, yeah, we found some couple of other points just to identify the shape a little more clearly. Okay, so there's your first page. And the second page starts with some simplifying of radicals. So now remember to write this as a mixed radical. I want to know what is the greatest perfect square value that I can take out of 32. So what's a factors, your factors of 32? So you should be thinking something like, well, 16, 16 times 2 is 32. So this is the same thing as 3 times the root of 16 uh, you can either put it underneath like this, 16 times 2, or you could root 16 times. I'll write both of them up just so you see what I'm trying to say. It's sometimes harder to explain. So I can write it like this, right? Root 16 times root 2 is root 32. So that's my largest perfect square number. And root of 16 is 4. So that's going to give me 3 times 4 times the root of 2. I'm doing this very long way. You could probably do it much quicker, but just to make sure you see all the steps. <coughs> 12 root 2. Okay, in letter B here, we have the square root of 48. Now, what's the biggest number in 48? Perfect square. Again, it's going to be a 16, right? So I'm going to have 2. This is like 16 times 3, isn't it? 16 times 3 is 48. Minus 3, and the largest perfect square in 27 is going to be 9. 9 times 3 is 27. So, again, I'm going to write it like this just because sometimes students don't see how you can just take that out. Okay, like this. So this means the root of 16 is 4, and 4 times 2 is 8. So this is going to be 8 square root 3 minus, now square root of 9 is 3, and 3 times minus 3 is minus 9 square root 3. And then because these have the same radical here, I can they're like radicals, I can subtract. So 8 minus 9 is minus 1 root 3. And there you go. Okay, the second part here is asking you to um, simplify. So you're going to expand first. So this is like a binomial with radicals in it. They look really ugly, but they're not hard to work with. <coughs> So the first one I'm going to do is 3 root 3 times the root of 3. So just be like your foil, you know, do these ones and this one and these two, these two. So 3 root 3 times root 3 is going to be 3 square root 9 because root 3 times root 3 is the root of 9. Now I'm going to do the next one. It's going to give me minus 6 and root 3 times root 2 is root 6. And then this one here is going to be minus 4 root 6. And this times this is going to be plus 8 square root 4. 
Okay, so obviously these things can be simplified a bit. The root of 9 is 3. 3 times 3 is 9. Minus 6 root 6 minus 4 root 6. I can combine these because they're like radicals. So that's minus 10 root 6. And 8 times the square root of 4 is 8 times 2. That's going to be 16. And then I just add these numbers together to give me 25 minus 10 root 6. And the last one here in this question grouping is 2 root 3 minus 3 root 2 squared. Okay, so maybe you can do it as square twice the product square. Or maybe you might want to write this one up because it has radicals in it. Sometimes it's easier just to write it out as two binomials first, right? Okay, so once I've done that, I'm going to do the same thing. So I have four and square root of nine. And then I have minus six root six. And then I have minus six root six. That's twice your product, right? And minus three root two times minus three root two is going to be plus nine square root four. And four um, times three is 12. Minus six minus six is minus 12 square root six. And nine times two is going to be 18. And I add these two numbers together to give me 30 minus 12 square root six. Number three, it says write in vertex form using a method of your choice. Well, I would probably choose completing the square because it's the easiest one to do. I'll, I'll do two different methods for you just so you see. Okay, so let's complete the square. So to complete the square, I have to factor out the coefficient of x, of x squared here from the first two terms. Remember, you leave the 6 alone. So that's going to give me x squared minus 8x plus 6. Okay, so we agree this is the same thing as that, right? Expand it backwards just to make sure. And now I'm going to do half the coefficient of x. So half of minus 8 is 4 squared, add it and subtract it. So that's plus 16 minus 16 plus 6. Now complete the square gives me a half x minus half of this one. So minus 4 squared and I have to take this one out of the bracket. So a half times minus 16 is minus 8 plus 16. Oh, where did I get the 16? That was just a 6. Let me get my fancy dancy eraser out here. It was only a 6 all along. And that's going to give me a half x minus 4 squared minus 2. Okay, now another way of doing the same question is to use the fact that the axis of symmetry is going to be x equals minus b over 2a. And I know that b is 4 minus 4 here, so minus minus 4 is 4 over 2a. 2 times a here is a half, so 2 times a half is 1, and that's going to give me 4. So that tells me that this, it gives me this value here, right? It gives me the x value. So now all I have to do is find um, the height of the function when x is 4, and that will give me the y coordinate here. So I won't do that. You can, you can plug it in yourself. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what you do. Okay, so... State the number of zeros of each quadratic function. Okay, so here I'm looking to figure out how, how will I know how many zeros this is going to have? Well, the best thing to do is to figure out where, well, this one is easy. This one is easy. This one's a little harder because it's, um, it's not in vertex form, right? So I can't tell immediately how many times that's going across the axis. So... If I look at this question here, I know that it's concave down. Let's do the B and C first. So it's concave down like this. And it has a vertex at minus 4 and minus 7. So that means it's way down here, right? 
So it's, if it's concave down and it has a vertex below the axis, it's not going to have any zeros. This one is concave up and it has a double root. So this is going to be at eight and zero because there's nothing here, right? So it's like plus zero. So eight and zero is going to put it out here and it's going to be concave up. So because this is a double root, that gives this one zero. Okay, so for this one, what I would do is I would use the discriminant. That was another little thing you learned in this lesson. And the discriminant tells you how many zeros there are going to be. So b squared minus 4ac. Okay, so what's b here? It's minus 5. b squared minus 4 times a times c. And of course, you know where I'm getting these from. This is a, b, c, right? Okay, that's going to give me, what, 25. And this is going to be 12 times 4. 12 times 4 is 48, minus 48. So that's going to be less than 0. The discriminant is less than 0. And that means that there are no roots. So no roots for that one. 0, 0, and 1 for that one. We didn't get any 2s. Hmm, tricky teacher. Okay, number five. It says, consider the quadratic function defined by f at x equals 25. There we go. x plus 7 squared minus 6. Determine the inverse of f at x. Is the inverse a function? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's just determine the inverse here. So remember that for inverse inverse, um, well first we're going to do let f at x equal y, that's a funny looking let, let's put a big L, let f at x equals y, so that's going to give me y equals 25 x plus 7 squared minus 6, and now we're going to switch variables. This is to find the inverse, so you want to know when is x is y and y is x. So I'm going to say x equals 25 y plus 7 squared minus 6. And now I have to isolate the y. Now I think you probably remember how to do this. We're going to move this number over. So I'm going to do x plus 6. Then I'm going to divide by 25. And that's going to leave me with this y plus 7 squared. And I'm going to take the square root of both sides. So when you take the square root, that's going to give you plus or minus on this side, plus or minus x plus 6 over 25 is equal to y plus 7. So that's going to give me y equals negative 7 plus or minus, oh, I forgot to put the square root sign on there, plus or minus the square root of x plus 6 over 25. 25. And so the inverse, well just a minute now, we if we write this as an inverse, um, it's not going to be a function, right? So this is the inverse, but it's not a function because we have plus or minus values here. So if we want to restrict this, so let's just write here the inverse is not a function, <coughs> which is our b. Inverse is not a function. Because you know what happens with these parabolas, right? They started going this way, and then you made them go this way. So we would never pass a vertical line test. So it gives you two values for y when x is some value which is not a good thing, it can only be one. Okay, state a restriction on the domain to ensure that its inverse will be a function. Now remember that to ensure it's going to be a function, you want to have the, um, the vertex. So let's, let's do just a quick little sketch of this thing up here. So the vertex is at minus seven and minus six, and it's concave up. So we'll have two x-intercepts. 
And we want to restrict the domain so that we're only dealing with half of this parabola, right? So that when we do the inverse, then we don't, um, as soon as we go over here, as soon as we switch the sideways, you're going to have two roots, not two roots. Sorry, you're going to have um, two values for y for a value of x. So you want to restrict it right here. So we want x to be um, x to be greater than or equal to, and what is this value here? That was minus seven, right? Minus seven, or x can be less than or equal to minus seven in order for the inverse to be a function. And so writing that out nicely in terms of a domain, you'd say the domain is going to be the set of x's such that x is less than or equal to minus 7. x is an element of real numbers. Or you'd say domain is equal to x such that x is greater than or equal to minus 7. x is an element of real numbers. So just beautiful format. Okay, number six. It says determine the quadratic function in the form ax squared plus bx plus c, so that standard form that has zeros at 3 plus root 2 and 3 minus root 2 and passes through the point 1 and minus 4, minus 1 and 4. Okay, so remember that um, because we have the zeros, we're going to be using the formula in factored forms, we have a x minus s times x minus t. Now over here, I'm going to write out which each of these things are. So we're trying to solve for a. Remember, you're always solving for a when you're finding the formula because you're trying to find the stretch or compression of the function. So we know where the zeros are. So we're going to say s is going to be equal to 3 plus root 2 t, we're going to set that to be 3 minus root 2. And going through a point gives us an x and a y. So you can see now we'll have everything but the a value. So x is minus 1, y is equal to 4. Now we plug all that in here and we're going to solve for our a value. Okay, so let's go. We've got 4 is equal to a times x is minus 1, and we're subtracting s, so make sure you change the signs, right? You plug that in, it's going to be minus 3 minus root 2. And we have x again is minus 1, and minus t is going to be minus 3 plus root 2. Okay, so... That gives us 4 equals a times, let's simplify this. So that's minus 4 minus root 2. And this is going to be minus 4 plus root 2. And if you're really clever, you'll recognize that this is a difference of squares that you could expand very quickly to be 16 minus um, root 2 the root of 4, right? But let's do it the long way, just so you don't say, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. So minus 4 times minus 4 is 16, and then I have minus 4 square root 2, and then I'm going to have plus 4 square root 2, so these are going to cancel out, and then minus 2 times root of 2, minus root 2 times root 2 is going to be minus the root of 4, and of course that's 2. So we can simplify this really nicely now. So these two cancel out and 16 minus 2 is 14. So we have well, a times 14 or 14 a would be nicer. So a is going to be equal to 4 divided by 14. Um, I don't like writing two equations on one line. So 2 sevenths. Okay, so now we're all set, and it says you want it, the equation, though, has to be in standard form. And that's kind of messy, right? So now that means I'm going to have to do some more expanding here. So here's my function. f at x equals 
a is 2 over 7. And now I have x and then minus this again, minus 3 minus root 2. And t, our second bracket is going to be x minus this one, so minus 3 plus root 2. And now I have to simplify this because this is in factored form and I asked for the question, the solution to be in standard form. So here we go again, 2 over 7, and now I have to expand. So x times x. Now this is where some students have some problems because there's um, like three things happening here, right? So I have x squared minus 3x so x squared minus 3x plus 2 root x so I have to multiply everything here and then minus 3 times x is minus 3x and then plus 9 and then minus 3 root 2 Oh, I think I'm going to run out of room here. And then I have minus 2 root x. Just a minute. Yeah, minus 2. Minus root 2x. Just a minute, sorry. Minus root 2x. So I'm doing this times this. Now this times this one. So that's plus 3 root 2 plus 3 root 2 minus the square root of 4. There, I squeezed it all in. Okay, so if you simplify all that, you're going to get 2 sevenths x squared. And a lot of these things are going to cancel out. So you're going to x squared minus 6x plus 7. So you'll see those things all cancel out. And you're going to end up with... Um, because it's not factored out, so you have to multiply this in. So 2 sevenths x squared minus 12 over 7x plus 2. Whoa, that was a tough question, wasn't it? Lots of expanding here because you had three terms here to work with. Okay, moving along.